Uh, yes. We are conducting an interview uh, with, what's your name, sir? Paul, G. Paul Hendrickson. My first name is really Jordan, but I, I don't go by that name. I go by G. Paul. Okay. Yeah. And so it's George Paul Hendrickson. Yeah. yeah. And how do you spell your last name? H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S-O-N. Okay. And uh, what year were you born? I was born in uh, October 24th, 1925. And where were you born at? I was born right here in Tower. So I take it your parents were living here in Tower at the time? Yes, they were. Okay. And uh, what were your parents' names? Pardon me? What was your mom and dad's name? His name was George. My mother's name was Esther. Okay. And uh, what was your mom? What was your mom's maiden name? Peterson. Uh, what was the What was the ethnic background of your parents? Well, my father was uh, he was station agent at Tower. He was a telegrapher, uh, really. So he worked for the DMNIR uh, quite a few years. And was he, uh, was he Swedish? Was he? Oh, he, he was Swedish and Finnish. Yes. Okay. And how about your mom? My mother was full blooded Norwegian. Okay. And my grandmother and grandfather came from uh, uh, Norway in 1883 or from Sweden. So you, Norway, Norway. So you came from a pretty uh, Scandinavian family. 18, yeah, definitely. All the way through. <laughs> okay. So your parents are both definitely Scandinavian. Yes. And uh, and when did they get married up here? Did they live their whole life up here too, or? Uh, they got married up in Tower, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, did the, did their parents come over, or were they, you know, were their parents? Did they grow up in the United States as well? My grandmother and grandfather Peterson they came from Norway in 1883 to Tower. Wow. Yeah. And my my grandfather uh, from uh, he uh, my grandfather my father's father grandfather. Lived in Aurora, hmm. yeah. And I, I don't know too much of the, their history for the Hendrickson part of it. So. But pretty impressive that your family has a long history in the city of Tower. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know my grandfather Hendrickson, he was drowned in Partridge Lake, I think, uh, by Aurora. So. Wow. Yeah. Um, did you ever get to meet your grandparents at all? Or? I, I met my grandmother. My grandfather was dead. He, my, my grandfather, uh, Peterson, he, uh, he died the year I was born, so I never did see him. So. Okay. Yeah. But, um, okay. And then as you, as you grew up here in Tower, you know, what were some of the things you did as a child that were for fun, I guess, in Tower? That was fun? Yeah. Oh, fishing. Huh? Yeah. What did you fish for? I fished for walleyes mainly on Lake Vermilion. And how was fishing different then to, compared to today? Oh, it was tremendous. I mean, you, you, you had to have, we fished with bamboo poles mainly from shore, huh? <laughs> and if you catch one walleye, you could use the eyes or the gills or anything, and then you just catch them one after the other. It was tremendous. Huh? <laughs> it has gone down drastically. The D DNR denies that, but uh, the walleye's population in Lake Vermilion is going down thanks to the muskies who are cleaning out the lake, so. And do you, were the muskies introduced in the Lake Vermilion, or were they always there? Well, from years ago, there it shows the maps of Lake Vermilion, muskies, you know, but then all of a sudden they disappeared, there was nothing. And then, I don't know how many years ago they started planting, probably within 10 years now. Huh? And so you think the muskie area was responsible? Oh, definitely. Every, every local person will say the same thing. Huh? Okay. And, and you think that, I'm just going to repeat this, but you sound like the, the walleye population has gone down. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so, and another thing that ruined Lake Vermilion was bass. Dr. Preston Bradley, who was a preacher from uh, Chicago, I think, he came up every year, and then he, he was bringing a bunch of bass to dump up in Bass Lake, just east of Lake Vermilion, and the storm came up and they had to dump them on Lake Vermilion, and after that the bass are taking over too, and they're detrimental. Hmm. I guided out of Edie for uh, two or three summers day when I was going to Dunwoody when I was a carpenter, so, hmm. and I saw the bass take over the lake. Wow. And this is a largemouth bass or a smallmouth? Oh, smallmouth. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, how often or was there any other activities that you would do as a kid besides fishing with your friends or any well, sort of games you guys would play around the neighborhood or? 
Oh boy, I'm trying to think of it. I, my 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 time was spent working because my father had turned it to be an alcoholic and he lost a job and we had a tough time going. So I had to work hard. I had to work hard. And <clears throat> what type of jobs were you doing at this point? I, I worked for a fellow by the name of Mike Driscoll who had a truck and uh, he had the gravel business and so forth and and. Uh, the Tower Sedan and Tower and Sedan School both filled their coal bins with coal, which was probably about oh, I don't know several thousand tons up. And every year I helped him to load those bins with coal, you know, with a scoop out of the box cars and huh? yeah. And then in Sedan years ago, they never picked up the garbage for the whole winter. Can you imagine how many um, how much accumulation they got there? And he always got the contract to clean up the alleys, eh? You imagine what that was like, eh? That had to be a lot of trash. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I shovel a lot of you know what. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how old were you when you started doing the work? Like, I probably was. Is that, well, I had a paper well, from the time I was in eighth grade through high school. I delivered the Duluth Herald eh, at that time. Eh? Uh -huh. And uh, when I started doing this work, probably probably was in eighth grade too. So, eh? <laughs> so you, you started working pretty young. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know... And do you remember the year the 1920s much? I mean, you were pretty young, you're only five years old, but do you remember? In the 1940s? In the 1920s. 20, oh, yeah. I don't remember much. There's a few things I remember as a kid, you know. I, I went to school in Tower until I was in first grade, huh? and then we moved to Sedan. Uh, it was in the middle of the winter. Huh? We moved to the first house coming into Sedan. Huh? And we moved with a team of horses. Jackie Stepman was the name. He hauled all our beef furniture with a team of horses and it was 40 below when we hauled that furniture in. That's cool. Yeah. And then my dad, he had bought this house, you know, he, he, before we moved, you know, he brought me up there and somebody had vandalized the whole thing, broke all the light fixtures and so we started out pretty badly. <laughs> but it was a good experience, huh? Yeah. And we, we fired up with an old heat troll of coal burning uh, stove and so forth and it, if you loaded with coal at night, early in the night, you know, you never, nobody filled it up during the night. Uh, if it was 40 below outside, it was 40 below in the house. Eh? Really, so. Yeah. How did you guys keep warm? A lot of blankets, huh? I know the first one that up built a fire in the heating range, big kitchen range down in the uh, kitchen, huh? And you had to get reservation to put your feet in the oven to warm up. And so. <laughs> um, so how was, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about tower. How was, how is Tower different today compared to then? Well, I, I, I don't Good see or bad. <laughs> Tower hasn't changed, which is, which is a bad thing, you know. The business people in Tower, they more or less didn't work together, you know. And it, was, it was always about that. And between Tower and Sedan, we, there was a confliction you wouldn't be because up in Sedan, the miners were treated really good. The Oliver Mining Company gave them houses and so forth and or practically everything for nothing. Huh? Yeah. So the Tower people were jealous of this, eh? We used to go from Sedan to Tower, and the Tower guys kids would say, "What are you Sedan bums doing in Tower?" Huh? <laughs> and to this day, that is still there, still there. So well, we can't. Then, we're two miles apart. We can't have one fire department. And I see you shaking your head as well. So I mean, it, there's definitely some agreement on. Okay. Two miles apart, and they will not join together. Wow. <clears throat> we, uh, had, we had conflicts with the police department too. We had service for both Tower and Sedan, and finally they disbanded. We were served by the uh, St. Louis County. Now they we have a sheriff. But it was County serving us. Sedan still has their uh, police force there. <coughs> it's uh, not very good, I think. No. Um, <coughs> so, you want to talk about how was school in this part of town? Was the school pretty well put together? Were your teachers pretty good? You went, it sounds like you went to school in Tower. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Well, when I, when I moved to, from Tower to Sedan to school, boy, there were some certain kids that picked on me, eh? That's for sure. Bullies, huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's where I got started off on the whole long track in education because I just felt left out. Huh? So, yeah. Do you remember any of those bullies' names? Huh? Never? Sure I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in your teenage years, it sounds like you were working a lot too, but uh, what were some of the things you did as a teenager around town? Was there oh, we always played football and baseball. Every, every place you looked, there was a field where somebody was playing some kind of sports. So we, we worked together, the kids, eh? Really good, really good. So. Yes. Any certain sport in particular you really liked, or pardon me? Any sport you like to play? I like football very much, but see, you see, I had a paper route, you know, that disrupted my whole thing because I had to deliver papers when I came out of high school, out of school eh, every day, and uh, but I did get to play a little bit there. Okay. It was my favorite sport. And 
And so I heard a little bit about this before. It sounds like you were always interested in joining the military before you even joined. Is that true? or? Well, not really. I never even gave it a thought. That's why I went until I was drafted. Eh? Oh, makes sense. Huh? <clears throat> and it was different when I got in then. I was very dedicated. So. And how old were you when you were drafted, I would imagine? I was uh, 18. And did you just graduate school fairly recently? Or were, you still, were you still in school? Or were you done? No, I had graduated in 1943. Huh? And, I, and I was drafted in January 1944. Huh? Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, what were you doing at the time? Were you, was there a certain job in town you were working on? Or? I was working for the Minnesota Box Factory, which was making boxes for ammunition and, and meat products for the service. Huh? That was been taken down on it was just uh, west of Tower here with a it was a big big facility is that wow yeah and but when they started going and getting the cardboard you know then they didn't, didn't use the wood anymore so but you were actually still helping out with the the home front oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah yeah and do you want to describe because I mean obviously the war was going on since 1941 what were some of the activities that were going around in Tower on the home front well, I'll tell you, there was a lot of people collected the aluminum foil from cigarette papers and so forth, and they, 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 were, they were really dedicated, the civilians here in, in town. And I, I, I was friendly with a real German family, Carl Beerworth was his name, and boy, they were the most patriotic people you could ever find. Huh? Really? And he had a brother in the German army too, but he was still wow. up the United States. Huh? Yeah, and I imagine that yeah, had to be kind of a tough thing for him at times. Yes, yes. yes. Um, <coughs> but... I imagine where people were overly patriotic at the time. I imagine everyone was very much helping out with the cause. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, on December 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor, <coughs> the day of Pearl Harbor, do you, do you remember that day? I remember it very vividly. Huh? I, went, uh, I went to see one of my friends up in Saddam, Auntie Sippler was the name, he was a full Finnish person and he said let's go skating so he skated up to the west end east end of Lake Vermilion huh? and there was glare ice not a bit of snow on it was just a beautiful day huh? and we stopped up there and talked to him I'm trying to think of his name now that but he was killed on a boating accident his motor blew up anyways uh, not that that's what his nickname was anyways he was a full blooded of Finlander yeah, and he had coffee that would curl your hair that's for sure huh? <laughs> so we came back and we I said let's go down to tower so we came down to tower and up through the river there, and somebody stopped and said, did you know that Pearl Harbor was just bombed? I said, no. That's when I learned about it. Wow. I'll never forget that day now. Yeah. It's, yeah. And so, this is also still right in the, in the throes of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> could you tell that there was a, the Great Depression on, or was it kind of just the same way it was in the 1920s, or? Do you want to describe that at all? Or? Well, it was pretty bad. I mean, we, we mainly lived on food stamps. Not, we didn't, they didn't have food stamps in there. We lived on commodities like powdered eggs, powdered milk, prunes, and things like that. They, we didn't get steaks like they do nowadays, you know, for welfare. So. Yeah. And my father, he uh, became a foreman, concrete foreman, when they built the D. Eric's liquor store. That was a city liquor store at that time. Okay. And so the, the Great Depression, I mean, obviously, FDR was very a major part in that. Yeah. And what are your thoughts on, on FDR? Do you think he was doing the right things during the Great well, Depression? I, I don't know if he's the one that started, but it was during the Depression that they started the CCC camps, if you know what familiar yeah. with that. Uh, that was a good, there was army tank trucks came by all day long from my house up to Ede. They did a lot of great work. I wish they still had that program today, huh? when a lot of people are out of work. Huh? Just put them in the field, put them in the woods to beautify them. But you're definitely a, a big fan of the CCC program then. Oh, definitely, definitely. It was very good. And so now I'm going to move you back forward a little bit again. And so how did you find out that you were drafted? I got my notice, eh? <laughs> what did they say on a draft notice, huh? Yeah, and were you kind of expecting it at all? or? Oh, I knew I'd get drafted. I knew it, so. Okay. And did you get any choice at all, or they just said you're drafted, you're going to the Navy? How did, how did that work? Well, that's where it all begins. I, I was drafted, and was, I think there was, I don't know if they call it a recruiting center. It was many, downtown Minneapolis, it was, uh, anyways, and uh, that's where I started with my physical. And uh, I got a lot of history in that uh, interview days. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, were, you, what, were you kind of worried to go down there when you're. 
No, I was all hepped up. I wanted to go in the worst way. I, I, <laughs> I was gung ho. Okay. I wanted to help the war effort. Eh? And, and you wanted to be in the Navy? Definitely. When I was drafted, that was my choice. Okay. And why did you want to be in the Navy versus the Army? Or? Well, I had an ambition to be an aviation radio man, gunner on an aircraft carrier. Okay. I, I, I was strong before, but I'll start off this way. I passed my physical without any problem, except I was colorblind, 100% colorblind. Huh? And they do not accept you in the regular Navy when you're colorblind. They put you in the CBs or the medics, eh? Yeah. And I pleaded with that recruiter, and I said, oh, yeah, I want to go in the Navy. I, 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 want, I, don't want, I want to go in the Navy. I want to get an aircraft carrier. He says, I'll pass you. So he passed me. Huh? Then he says, uh, what, any specialty branch you want to be in? I said, definitely, I want to be an aviation radio man gunner. And so when he, and then he finally informed me, he said, your IQ is too low, you can't go to school, you didn't have the IQ. This is one of my main problems. But from then on, you want to know the rest of it? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, then I went to Farragut, Idaho, and, and at the Camp Hill, Farragut, Idaho, the, as a Navy training base there. And I can't remember how long the course was anyways, but it, it was on the day before I was supposed to finish school, I was in the chow line, and I passed out completely. I, I ended up the hospital, I was in the scarlet fever ward, or pneumatic fever to begin with, uh, and that was worse than scarlet fever. Then they finally diagnosed me as, as being scarlet fever. Uh, wow. And I was in there for 21 days. And, uh, and I came out and I finished my schooling and was sent home on a 15 day leave. Uh, <laughs> but this is one thing, why Why did I get scarlet fever at that time? Uh, yeah. Okay, then. And I went home from my 15-day leave, and, uh, and my orders were to go to Bermonton, Washington. Uh, so I, I was there, and uh, and it happened to be that my father was an electrician in a uh, shipyard there. Huh? And I, I was just going to be overnight before I was shipped out. Huh? And I said, I'm just going to take a walk down around the harbor and so forth, see if I, there's no chance, I because I, I didn't know where my dad was or anything. Huh? Yeah. Like the first ship I saw was a destroyer. I looked down there by a gun mount, and I said, I can't believe it, that's my father. <laughs> Hundreds and hundreds of ships there, and there he was. Huh? <laughs> I called her dad. Huh? So, so your dad was serving too, then I take it? Huh? Your dad was serving in the military as well? No, no, he was a civilian. He was working in the shipyard as an electrician. Wow. He was a civilian. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And I called her dad. Oh, and he couldn't believe it. And I said, I mean, finally we'd have a little lunch and have a conversation with him, and that was it. But it was, it was another one of those fate things. That. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Cool story, though. Um, and so I guess, tell me, what, what happened after that? Where did you go from then, there? Then I was, I, I, I went on, let's see, I'm trying to think of the right order now. I think it was a, a, a cruiser, Houston, right? And I went on the cruiser, Houston, to San Francisco, and then from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor, and I was there for about two weeks. Huh? And then I was... How do you like Hawaii? Huh? How did you like Hawaii? Oh, I never suffered so much as Hawaii. I, I mean, more standing around on the hot beaches in downtown Honolulu. I, mean, I, I, I ate and I drank more pineapple than I ever cared to in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it was hot. I suffered it. I suffered there. Okay. It was not like a life a civilian would have when he went to Hawaii yeah. on a vacation. So. Then I went aboard the battleship Colorado and I was shipped over to the Majuro Islands. Uh, I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't. I didn't have my orders. I didn't know where we were going to go. And I said, "Geez, I wonder." So we went in a small craft, you know, and so forth, and uh, with another dozen or so of guys, and uh, we went through this harbor. We went past destroyers, cruisers, battleships, and not knowing where I'm going to go. All of a sudden, there loomed the head an aircraft carrier. We headed right towards it. I says, "I can't believe it. Thank God. Huh? At least I got on an aircraft carrier." <laughs> and and. And, and what was your role at this point? Huh? What was your role? Were you ra were you were you a radio man like you wanted? To no, be? no, I was just a seaman. First, not first class, seaman second class, or whatever. Okay. You thought, what do you thought in the navy? Yeah, that's not been apprentice seaman, something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so when you saw the aircraft carrier, do you know what the name of it was? Essex. That was Essex. <laughs> there was an Essex. So. Okay. But again, fate. God left, has led my life. Look, several instances already on this. Huh? Not only that, I didn't know what division I was to put on. I was put on the flight deck crew, landing and la launching aircraft. Eh? Close, so close to what I wanted to be, huh? Yeah. And I, I worked in these uh, landing and launching. I don't know if you ever saw pictures of carriers or what you did. You know, you had jeeps that pulled them and tractors that pulled them and you pushed them and had to fold up the wings on certain planes. And uh, it was exciting, huh? Yeah. So. yeah. And how, 
How big was the, the aircraft carrier? It was 900 feet long, three football fields, uh, and it weighed about, I think, dead weight was 27 or 28,000 before any loads on it. So. And, and how many guys were on the ship? 3,000. 3,000. And uh, how many of those guys did you get to know? Not too many, not too many, because with the job we had, you were busy, and it would get later on when it came to action, yeah. you didn't have much time for anything. And I, I, I can't remember probably the name of uh, half a dozen people I was in service with. Right? So do you, what are some of the guys that you hung out with the most that you do remember? Any of them by name, by chance? Uh, there was a headland from Minneapolis, I know. And, uh, well, well, I'll tell you, this, this is where memory is gone. Yeah. I, don't worry about it. I, you know, what started, when I was in the recruiter, this bothered me all the way through, you know. The recruiter says, if you want to stay in the Navy after the war, you got to sign up for six years there. Eh? So I signed up for six years. Eh? <laughs> and after, after the war, you know, people are getting discharged, and uh, I said, I can't get out. And it, it bothered me all the way through my days on the Essex, eh? <laughs> knowing that I wasn't going to get out after the war was over. So you're, you're there for the long haul. Yeah, <laughs> that that changes too because I'm. Uh, okay. Yeah. So tell me about a little bit about your operations. How was it? What was your job? What were you doing exactly then? On the Essex. We uh, we 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 had we had to respot the flight deck. You know, we, usually the planes are all lined up in the to the about stern, eh? Uh, and usually about seventy planes on there, different types: TBF bombers and F six F fighters and uh, SBTC dive bombers, and then there was. A Navy gull wing or a Marine gull or a unit two that had a bought Sikorsky Corsair, the gull, gull wing uh, plane, huh? and uh, the, the planes took off. And then when the planes landed, we had to after they they, they we had to we had to respot them on the on the front day, eh? so okay. the rest of the planes to land. After all the planes are in, then we had to take all the planes and move them back again, the spot them on the bow ready to take off again. And would you you would just probably tow the you would tow them right you want to start the plane back up and drive it around. No, we we towed them. Usually after after they went uh, what got cooked by that lat, uh, landing hook you know which catches the cable there, then the pilot would run the plane up to the bow and so forth and they they put position themselves. Right? Okay. But then when when we put them back we had to pull them with jeeps and uh, with tow bars. And, yeah. And and where were you? Uh, what start? Where did you run into, or where did you first join the USS Essex at again? What Pardon was, me? What was the series of islands called where you first got... Maduro Islands. Uh, that, I think that was the first island the uh, America invaded down there. Uh, okay. After Pearl Harbor, there was, uh, besides Bougainville and that uh, Guadalcanal area. And, and, and where, did you, where did you go on from there? Where did the Essex move on to? Well, it was a few days after I went aboard the Essex, we... Uh, we went into uh, soften up Saipan uh, for the invasion of Saipan. Our plane, our planes would go out there and they'd bomb and strafe and take out uh, facilities that the Japanese had there. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, and then, oh, uh, the first day that I was on there, when it, the first launch we had, I told the guys, I said, "Only oh, gonna get some action." I came up with action. I huh? said, "You get it soon, eh?" It wasn't ten minutes later a Japanese plane came down off the bow of the turn, you know. Heading right down, right to where I was standing on a, a catapult, huh? And he dropped his bomb, but missed by just a few feet, huh? Blew up there. And I think Wayne Morris, who was a movie actor at that, I don't know if you remember him, that's a long time ago. He was a, on the, the catapult at that time, and we launched him, and he went down after that draft, and he shot it down, so. Huh. And the guy said, Did you have enough yet? I said, No, I want more, huh? So, <laughs> so what were you thinking, though, when that first plane came in? Were you, you get a little worried there, I'd imagine, or? No, I didn't, I didn't know. All of a sudden, I'm standing there, pretty soon there's a plane ahead of diving on us, and the shrapnel flew up after the bomb blew up on the, with the plane deck. And <laughs> it all happened pretty quickly, it sounds like. Pardon me? It happened pretty quickly? Oh, yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> so, uh, so what happened after that? Where did you go from there? Well, during the uh, invasion of Saipan, that's when the Japanese knew that we were getting bases close to Japan, so they wanted to do everything they possibly could to disrupt our operation. So they came in with a fleet of carriers and uh, battleships. They still had Guam at that time and uh, quite a few airplanes on Guam. <coughs> what, they, <coughs> what they called was the Marianas Turkey Shoot. Huh? There was about maybe 8,000 Japanese planes came after us. Eh, huh? wow. And it, it, there was some action. Eh? <laughs> we shot, we, uh, 
downed, oh my God, 400 different Japanese planes were shot down that day. Huh? Yeah, they didn't. There was a few got into us, but and we had a commander McCampbell. He was in charge of the fighter group. He shot down nine in one day. But oh, he was greedy. Huh? I mean, he took he took kills away from his uh, wingman and everything. Huh? He'd, he'd land and he said, "Get that thing gassed up and fuel and armed again. I want to take off." Huh? He was a gung ho guy. <laughs> and how many? How many did he get in one day? He said eight. Pardon me? How nine. Many? Nine. Nine in one day. That was a record. He shot down nine in one day. Very under turkey shoot. But he he was given the Medal of Honor after the war, and there was a uh, destroyer named after him. But. <laughs> And so, did you? You got to meet him, obviously, and you you knew him. Oh, every day, every day. I mean, we worked close to these pilots. And, uh, yeah. <coughs> um, and, and how was he otherwise? Was he was he a nice guy to deal with otherwise, or was he? Very, very good, very good. Yeah, yeah. But he was the one that was egotistic. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate to put this down if it's going to be a corner, but uh, but that's the truth. That's yeah. Uh, everybody will tell you. He, he was reprimanded many times by the. Uh, Kept it, so so uh, on days like that, you know, how, I imagine you had to be very busy then. Oh, busy, busy, busy. Like that, we we probably have uh, like Saipan, you have probably about four bombing missions in a day. So these planes would take off, they'd come and what would we have to respot the deck, go up again four times in a day. You didn't have much rest. Oh wow! Yeah. And how, how was the food on the Essex? It was really good, really, really good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, what what was what were you eating? Oh, on, on, on holidays, where we had the best. We had turkeys and cranberries, and mashed potatoes, everything. But the other food, I mean, we had SOS. If you know what that is, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody must have told you about that. Huh? Yeah. But I, to this day, I still like it, huh? I, I, I've heard that too, yeah. and I've heard others uh, not so much. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, so how, how often one, one thing we had that they didn't have it in the army, I'm sure, and so forth, we had an ice cream uh, stand. At, boy, you could get sundaes and banana splits and everything. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to believe it. <laughs> um, so it sounds like you, the cooks are doing a pretty good job. Oh, yes, yes. Considering feeding 3,000 men. So. Oh, that'd be, that'd be pretty tough. Um, and, and how did you deal with the, the seasickness? <clears throat> I never got seasick one time, so. Wow. But I, I'll, I'll carry this a little further. After the service, I went to bring my brother-in-law to Detroit, Michigan. He wanted to go to college there, and I went took the ferry there, where the bridge is nowadays. Uh, I got seasick <laughs> <laughs> on Lake Superior, so. Yeah, I, I would definitely get sick, so. Um, okay, so where did you guys move on from Saipan? Then we went over and we bombed Guam, of course, and uh, then we went, uh, started, I think, I believe it was the Philippine Islands that we started bombing that for invasion there. Uh, okay. Yeah. And were there ever at any point in time where you were getting a little worried about the Japanese or where you thought that they were getting a little bit stronger? Or? I was looking forward to, for them to come after us there. Uh, or they were getting after the Mariana's Turkey shoot, some of the, most of the good pilots were all shot down. Uh, Okay. After that, most of their pilots are nothing but kids. You know, a lot of them graduated from the University of California. Many, many of them. So, in fact, when you took prisoners, you know, when we shot down a plane and took a prisoner, we were a pigeon ship. Then they used to transport it across. There. I got pictures of that on pulling, pulling them across between yeah. the destroyer and Essex. And they were very, very humble. Huh? <laughs> yeah. well, they were out to kill us, but after that, they were humble. Us. <laughs> uh, they, yeah. Um, and so, talk about. Do you remember anything specific? Any stories from Guam or the Philippines? Any any action or any anything funny that happened on the on the ship at this point? Or well, I, I think the first like the Leyte. I, I don't know. I think that's the first place they invaded uh, was Leyte. This that's when MacArthur landed. Uh, I had returned. Eh? Yeah. And it, uh, the rumor was out that uh, there was a fleet of. Uh, Trans troop transfers coming from China. So we were sent over China. We bombed Hong Kong and Swan uh, wow. and several places. And, uh, and I think that we must have, the Corps Fleet must have, troop ships that must have killed at least 250,000 Japanese that would have got the Leyte, huh? and it would have made the war a lot tougher. Eh? Yeah. See, people say, my brother in law, he was in the Army on Leyte too, and he got wounded. He said, What did you guys do in the Navy, anyways? And I, I mentioned about the time we sunk all those Japanese troop ships, you know, that we would have been in trouble. If, uh, Oh, yeah. <coughs> I never heard about that. 
Um, so what do you think of MacArthur? Well, <laughs> you know what happened in the Korean War where uh, he got retired, eh? Yeah, yeah. He made a, he made a horrible, I, I think he was another one of egotistic uh, that picture of him going on a show, you know, I shall return, but so proud with it. Huh? Yeah, I ask because uh, many veterans I've interviewed have a, a similar opinion. Yeah, yeah. So it's always interesting. Um, and was that kind of a common feeling amongst the guys, do you feel? Or? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. Um, yeah, tell me a little bit about your the, the Chinese troop ship. I mean, how long were you guys over there? Pardon me? How long were you over by China? Oh, we went there for so probably about three, four days of raiding, huh? Okay. And then we came back out again. And that was about the time the Japanese were coming down with a big fleet from Japan and so forth. And there was another one. The Marianas Turkey shoot and this one, which they called uh, the Philippine Sea Battle, eh? were two of the biggest battles ever fought in the history of the United States. Huh? And the Japanese came down with battleships and unsuspected that we couldn't, we knew they were around there. They were all around different islands. They finally got all together and they came in with battleships and the battleships were 30 miles, 40 miles behind us only, huh? And we wait for the shells to start coming because I think they got to be within 15 miles for their shells to reach it. And uh, we sunk quite a few of those ships to begin with. Mm. So those battleships got into a group of Jeep carriers, which are small carriers, and they sunk two or three. You know, those guys went through a lot too with taking those big 18-inch shells coming at them. So. Oh, yeah. And so, how did it? How did it feel to be part of all this at the time? I, I, I felt good. I felt good. I felt good. Okay. Um, I, I, I've always wanted excitement in my life, and I sure got it. Eh? <laughs> to this day, I want it. Eh? <laughs> Sounds like it. Um, so, what happened after the, the the Philippine Sea Battle? Was there? Well, d during all this time, we, we were we were bombing uh, Okinawa for softening up Famosa and different places, and then, uh, uh, in fact, I still remember oh, Doolittle was the first one who bombed Japan. But then, it was uh, one day the captain announced. Tomorrow we will bomb Tokyo, huh? That was the first raid by our carry outside of Goodle that bombed Tokyo, so. <laughs> and the, and the, the uh, chip paper showed a cartoon of everybody jumping overboard when he said, we're gonna strike Tokyo tomorrow, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but we went up there and then we were there for a couple of days, but we were very fortunate because the weather was foggy and rainy and we were able to launch planes and bomb the Japanese airfields and shipyards and so forth, but they, yeah. they had planes coming around us all day for two, three days there. They Never. could not find us. Eh? <laughs> Another blessing of God, he put that shield over us. Eh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, so overall, you know, we, we I, I think I was on about 26 different raids on Japan, every province, uh, Hokkaido, and uh, we came a lot of times within 70 miles of the Japanese mainland. Yeah. And and they never, the Japanese know they, they never got close to bombing you out there at all? Well, they tried, you know. We, we, were, we were missed by many, many, many bombs. bombs. So God was on your side many times. Oh, there. boy, that's for sure. That's for sure. <coughs> um, and so wh where did you guys go after your... Then, and then uh, oh, oh, we had, I think about that, after the Philippine invasion, we went for Iwo Jima. To soften that up, that's when they invaded Iwo Jima, because they needed a base, you know, to land crippled aircraft that were going to bomb Japan, eh? Yeah. And the B-29s, pretty. So we softened that up and had the invasion and <laughs> took it. So. And I still remember coming into Iwo Jima Harbor that time, and uh, there was still some fighting, but more or less the Japanese had given up, and boy, the stench was horrible. Huh? You could smell dead bodies. Really. And how close, I mean, so you, you went ashore we then? Right in, oh, we were right in the harbor, you know, probably two, three miles from shore. Wow. Um, See, a lot of times they went into harbor to take on supplies like food and ammunition. Most of the times we'd, we'd be bombing a certain area, we'd pull it back two or 200 miles or so, and, that, and the, uh, troop, the transports would be out there with their food and ammunition or whatever, so. Yeah. Um, wow. And so, <coughs> how long were you at Iwo Jima? How, much, how long were you helping that out? We were there uh, probably till uh, after the uh, they cleared it, you know, after the Japanese surrendered on it. So. Okay, yeah. and then and then where do you get shipped to from there? I guess then we then we headed for uh, Okinawa. That was the main. That was when they were going to bomb when they, when they invade Okinawa. Huh? So, yeah, yeah. And, and what? How did you assist the invasion of Okinawa? We, we, our, our camp went in and we, we bombed a few facilities and airports and whatever, huh? Yeah. 
Okay. Entrenchments and uh, yeah. Yeah. Essex did a fine job of softening up for them. <laughs> really. So. And and from the ship, could you see what was being bombed at all, or was that too no, far away? No, we were far enough out. Huh? Yeah. I I was out there eighteen months eh, overseas. Huh? Yeah. I saw. I was on land four hours in the Philippines. We had a shore leave. Huh? <laughs> yeah. And we got four four bottles of beer. Eh. I didn't drink at that time, so I sold my beer for a dollar a bottle. Eh, so. <laughs> <laughs> but we were off Okinawa, 79 straight days without any let up in action. Wow. Never came ashore, 79 days. Eh. The longest tour of any ship ever made. Eh. And I mean, it was tough. It was, that's the time they were really using suicide planes. Everything, every plane was a suicide plane. Huh? Yeah. And, and was that, were you guys more worried about the suicide planes than the, than the bombs before? Or? What were your thoughts when you started to see the, the suicide Oh, definitely, point? because when they came down there after the kill, you know, there was experiences we had, you know, where before they started suicide, where a Japanese plane would come in with a bomb and he, he couldn't drop the bomb and he, he didn't crash, he went off and hit another ship or tried to get another ship. And yeah. We happened to come in, had him come in with torpedoes, the torpedo wouldn't be released, he'd come up over the flight deck and drop down. I tell my own time, the Massachusetts battleship, he got him, so, huh? So, and they had a lot of faulty uh, bombs <laughs> and torpedoes. They weren't ordered for the United States war because we had trouble with torpedoes that uh, during the Second World War, terrible trouble. Huh? Yeah. <coughs> and so, did you mind being at sea this long? I mean, did you want to go to land? I mean, what was your No, I, I didn't really care. I didn't really care. <laughs> yeah. really? It was interesting going to the Philippines, you know, but and hot and sultry. Oh, I never suffered so much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And at least you got fresh bananas or a dollar bundle, and huh? it was <laughs> really uh, delicious. So. I didn't give those away. Eh? No. Yeah. And a dollar for a beer, that's a pretty good price yeah. back then. Then there, then there was quite a few prostitutes over in the Philippines, too. You know, I'm not going to go into detail on that. <laughs> <laughs> really, the, the Philippine women were actually selling their daughters for sex to a lot of guys in the Navy. So. Dollar, dollar, dollar for daughter. Wow. Uh, and I imagine a lot of guys took the, took the bait. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not me, though. Not me, though. <laughs> um, yeah, I've uh, I've interviewed several guys who uh, who have taken the bait. So oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. This is that was kind of a funny story. Um, but uh, how how prominent was that? I mean, were were quite a few of the guys taking advantage of? Oh, I think so. I think so. Yeah. You know, when you've been. Out the seas for some of those guys had been out there for, for two years already, so forth. then it, you know, you would, yeah. yeah, just yeah. like for alcohol, huh? There were so many stills, you know, they made alcohol, cooks especially made alcohol of raisins, anything they could get a hold of, eh? Huh? And they drank torpedo juice, eh? In fact, one time when we went to the Philippines, I'm sure that time there was a couple of guys that had drank torpedo juice, juice and they packed it, they almost died, you know. Huh? Wow. They wouldn't cut it with anything, that's alcohol, you know. 100% almost, huh? Wow. Yeah. You know, it's called torpedo juice? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, what were some of the things you guys did in your downtime on the ship? Did you guys ever play card games or? Oh, we had boxing. I was a boxer too, eh? And uh, we, had, we had basketball in the, in the hangar decks, you know? And uh, we had good, then, then we played football on the flight deck. And uh, I still remember one time I went for a pass and uh, I reached my arms up and it threw my shoulder completely back on my back and really dislocated it up. Uh -huh. And it was, we were in, in a harbor someplace some at that time and uh, they, they finally had to get three doctors from three different ships to get that thing back in place. It was painful. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, especially because you got probably a lot of work you had to do on the ship later too. Yeah, yeah. But I wasn't laid up probably only for about a week. Huh? Okay. Um, and so. We'll continue on. So what happened after Okinawa? Where did you move on from there? Well, we more or less stayed around. We kept bombing Japan. and But during Okinawa, what, what they had, they, these people went through hell. Huh? They had what they call a picket line huh, between Okinawa and Japan. Huh? This was destroyers that were up there, and they would they would be there. They positioned themselves halfway between Okinawa and Japan and report any ship, any planes coming down. Huh? I had a cousin from Duluth that was on one of those destroyers and the Japanese really hit those. His ship was hit by six kamikazes huh? wow. and he survived. Eh? The picket duty was, they went to hell. Huh? Okay. Yeah, they were sitting ducks, sitting ducks. But those guys, boy, they, they, they were never recognized for what they did. So. And you refer to it as, a, as, a, as the picket line, correct? Pick, the picket duty, picket, picket duty. duty. Yeah. 
Okay, and where did you move on from Okinawa? You said you bombed Japan again? Yeah, and I, I think we were right off Japan when uh, they had the first atomic blast up there. We were probably 60 miles from Japan. Uh, oh, we, you wow. couldn't, we couldn't see the cloud formation or anything. But, uh, and then a few days later, of course, the Japanese surrendered. Uh, and how long? We, we were ready to, we were all set up to go into Japan. I, w I was designated as driving a jeep and so forth when he really went into Japan after they surrendered. I, mean, I wish I had, but all of a sudden, we had been one of the ships that were out to the longest down, so we were sent back. We, we picked up maybe 2,000 Army and different troops, you know, to transport back to the United States uh, okay. after the war. Um, when we dropped the bomb, yeah. did you, how long, when did you hear about that we did it? The same day, so right after that. Right wow. Now, yeah. And uh, what, what were your thoughts, and what were some of your other shipmates' thoughts at the time? Well, they didn't surrender. I figured they aren't going to give up. We're going to have to get in there and invade. And if we had had an invader go there, every one of those citizens, because we was on suicide mission, they would have been a horrible thing, huh? Yeah. We had to do it because boy, it would have cost millions of American lives, I think, huh? So, I mean, looking back, are, are you thankful that we dropped the bomb? Yes, or? yes, yes. Okay. It's a terrible thing for the people that suffered that were so innocent. Huh? Okay. But you think in the end maybe it saved more lives, or is that... Oh, yes. If we had to invade Japan, boy, we would have been in really serious trouble. And, and, and I imagine a lot of people were kind of ready, or I don't say ready, but yeah. were awaiting that. Yeah. I know several Marines I've interviewed, you know, that was their next thing. They were going in Japan. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but I'll tell you, with, with the raids that B-29 had been on, we had that country all blessed. These, I, mean, I can show you pictures of some cities before the bomb just completely flattened out, huh? Yeah. So those B-29s did a tremendous job, huh? And it's a good thing they had an Iwo Jima and Saipan to land, you know, if they were crippled, eh? Hey? Mm -hmm. That saved a lot of life there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, when the Japanese finally surrendered, uh, I imagine you had to be pretty excited to have the war over. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, was there any, was there a party on the ship, or was there any, any type of celebration? No, or? not really, not really. I think it's more or less people were just relieved that it was over, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, and then, like you said, you, you picked up a, something, a bunch of guys from the Army? Oh, yeah, different service men. We had about 2,000 extra men when we went back. And we went, uh, uh, we, went, we took the Great Circle Route, which is hard to believe, but it's shorter to go around Alaska than straight across there. So they call it the Great Circle Route. It goes around by Alaska. Huh? Okay. And we came from weather that was 90, 100, 110 above, you know, to about 30 above, you know, and a few days later. We had no gear to keep warm. Eh? <laughs> what a change in the two days! Eh? So. <laughs> um, and how was your how was the travel back? Was it pretty decent? Or? Oh yeah, very decent, very okay. decent. Yeah. And those army guys did they handle it okay, or did they get too sick? Oh or? yeah, no trouble, no trouble. And, and where did you where did you land at? Was San Francisco, Washington. 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 You remember this pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything that I've passed over? Any stories that you have of? of of your time while you're overseas, that uh, it was left what, out. What about your kamikaze attack? Oh, I'm trying to think of that date. Okay, I was on, on the uh, catapult crew that time, uh, and I'm trying to think of what battle it was, and what what uh, island we were working at, something up in. But uh, there was a cloud formation in the bow of the ship there. Uh, and all of a sudden, the ACAC started going up into that cloud there. Huh? And I'm on the flight deck just looking up there, and all of a sudden, I see the Japanese plane come down about a 60 degree angle straight down to the flight deck where I'm standing. I stood in awe, and I said, I can't believe it. He came down within 100 feet of the flight deck. Yeah? I could see his goggles, I could see his scarf on there, the kamikaze pedestal, yeah. and so forth. I jumped to the catwalk on the side, I got on my knees, I said, Dear God, I'm not going to make it. But if I make it, I'm going to dedicate my life to you. Traveling 400 miles an hour, 100 feet of the ship, all of a sudden, something took him and just picked him up and threw him on the side of the ship, eh? There's no way the momentum should have crashed him right in, but all of a sudden, there's no way that you could maneuver a plane like that. Something picked him up and just like that, threw him on the side, and it blew up underneath the catapult, eh? So, my catwalk, huh? Wow. Yeah. And the caption said, I got a pic there's a picture of it there, and it said, he had us cold turkey, but couldn't crash. And I'm here today. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great story. Oh, I mean, oh, I mean, hi. 
we, we, uh, we were involved in 376 raids against our fleet, you know. 376, eh? Huh? The Essex was one of the best ships out there. Huh? Huh? <laughs> it's I'm a very famous ship, yeah, huh? yeah. It was, it was, it was. Huh? Yeah. I've got things here I could show you that. Huh? Yeah. Um, is there anything, any part of your story, though, that we left out yet, or <coughs> besides your, your journey back home yet? Well, I just, I just don't want to skip over well, anything. So, the, what what gets me is they talk about homosexuals. I was a young kid. I experienced it. You know, I was tried, I was attacked by quite a few guys out there, getting trying to get at me. Yeah, so that was bad. And a lot of these people just disappeared overnight. They threw them overboard. Yeah. Really? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wow, that's a story you don't hear often either. Uh, it's just some, I, I don't. I, I, I'm not, I don't condemn hope. Um, I think it's just a hereditary thing. But why? Uh, these guys got so desperate to get me. They fact they wanted to kill me. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but they disappeared. You said. Well, not all of them, but, but uh, some. Um, okay. Um, and so when you arrived back to uh, Bremerton, Washington. Yeah. Uh, you took a train back. Is that how? Tell me about your, your return uh, journey, I guess. Okay, I, 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 we came back to Bremerton. I was scheduled for the second bunch of guys to go and leave or, fifth, or I don't know, 15 or 30 days, whatever it was, and the, and the captain announced, he said, if there's anybody that I was how to type, please inform us. So, and I said, I did. So I, I, I went down there to the yeoman's office, which is a, you know, they take care of all records and everything, and I was put in as a yeoman. Okay? And I did the plan of the day, just 065, uh, verbally, and breakfast at this time and that time, so I printed that every day. And then, then I was given a job of these guys that went AWOL or AOL. I had to contact the police forces in their cities, you know, and I looked into the fact that this guy was AWOL or so forth. Yeah. And they, 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 we caught a few of them. Huh? I was very fortunate to get on the. This is, and I, I, I got a very good. Uh, uh, the, uh, I'm trying to think of the name. He was one of the head men as, and as far as the book work part of the ship was. Oh, uh, but uh, the guy, I, I was I was helping discharge these guys, you know, that I had more time out of them and I, I felt bad. Here these guys are getting home and I got to stay in for another four years. Man. Yeah. It bothered me badly. So I, I went to see the chaplain about this and so forth and I said, that recruiter in Minneapolis, you give false information because I don't think it's true that you had to sign up for six years. Huh? And I went to the commander, you know, hey, other guy and uh, talked to him about this. I was very fortunate to know him. Good, so. And they worked together and they finally got me discharged. Uh, <laughs> and I think they got that guy who said that you had to sign up for six years. I think he had been doing it to quite a few guys. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. So you were probably happy to have that. Oh, yes. I wanted to get home in the worst way. Uh, so. yeah. Sometimes I think back, I said, I wonder if I had spent 20 years in the Navy, where I would have been. Cause I had a good position with the yeoman boy. I, I, was, I was up on top of the, all the paperwork and so forth. Yeah. And, and um, when you came back, did you go straight to the tower, or did you live somewhere else for a while? Or? I came right to tower. Huh? In fact, I, I, I signed up at the Edie Junior College. I wanted to be an architect in the worst way. I, oh, I know. But when I went to school, this, this system was bad. You only had to go to eighth grade mathematics, and this is what I lacked is mathematics. Eh? And I didn't. I couldn't cut the mustard being an architect. Huh? So, yeah. well, you know, one strange story. When I was coming home after the Second World War on a leave, eh, I uh, was in, it was around Christmas, it was in Missoula, Montana, the train broke down, eh, and I figured well, I'd better call my mother, eh, you can let her know I won't be able to make it. Huh? So I got on the phone, this was Christmas Eve, I got on the phone and talked to her and I said, Mom, I can't make it home. She said, I can't talk to you, Paul. She hung up. Eh. And I said, what's wrong? I couldn't believe it. What did I do to make her mad? Yeah. Two days later, when I went back to the ship, I got a letter from me. She said, I'm sorry I hung up in your pub, but the house was burning down around me. That house down there. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You almost had a valid excuse then. <laughs> and I completely destroyed it, though. Wow. That's where Fraser's lived down there. That was a two big two story house. <laughs>